Welcome to the Disappearing Student um, Workshop, Helping Students Persist and Succeed. Um, we're very excited to have you all joining us today. We have uh, people from different disciplines, and that provides the, uh, a good foundation for discussion and um, interactions. Today, we will have some brief introductions, and we will get into the content. We'll talk about community, projects, and assessments feedback, grading, and we'll have a, a wrap-up Q&A session. And to get the community going, if you would please type in the chat your name, your department, what you teach or what your role is at NIU, and what does perseverance mean to you? We'll be talking about that throughout the session today. So if everyone could please get started typing their introductions in the chat box. Um, Hi, Tim. Okay, I see we have Carrie, Helen. Um, we have people from, in looking at the, the list of, of people in today, we have people from marketing, English, economics, uh, Catherine Maruzak is from Health Sciences, Anna Kliss from Economics, and Shakun Yu, um, uh, Carol from Department of Accountancy, Patty Wallace, um, okay, Helen Nagata, great. So we have a, a good mix of, of different disciplines and expertise, which is um, really good for starting um, the conversations in, in this session today. Now, Megan is going to talk about the importance of community. Go ahead, Megan. Thanks, Vaughn. All right, and it sounds like we have a really an eclectic group, so I like this a lot. All right, so since we're going to be talking about disappearing students, I, I do want to at least identify what we mean by um, saying identi um, identifying students who are disappearing or potentially could disappear, um, and then how the importance of community will play a factor in this. So when we look at students who are disappearing from their coursework, it's really not a, a blame scenario. Um, this could happen for a variety of reasons. So um, when we're looking at these students, these could be students who maybe have enrolled in your course, but they never attended or maybe just attended the first few courses, um, but they're still on your roster. We could be looking at students who started out strong, but then their attendance and or their coursework tapered off. And we could also be looking at students kind of who blend into the crowd. And this could, again, be due to a couple of different factors. You might have students who are a little bit more introverted and prefer to almost remain anonymous. Or it could just be that somehow, for some reason, you have students who are getting lost in the shuffle. And the idea here is that all of your students are unique individuals and they do enhance the classroom environment. So we want to make sure that we, we give them kind of some of that individual attention. So we want to help our students form a community. So forming a community means that they are building bonds with their peers, uh, but also you as an instructor. And so I kind of listed some of the attributes or the aspects of a community. Um, and I did find, I thought, a nice quote to go, to go along with it. Um, but when we talk about building a community in the classroom, this is also part of making it a student-centric environment. Uh, our, our students are not just, you know, sponges for knowledge. Uh, we have to actively engage them. And so part of this is, yes, getting them together, uh, sharing thoughts, sharing ideas, and ultimately maybe trying to solve some sort of a problem. So what can we do to create this inclusive space? I, I do love this picture that's kind of up on the screen. Hopefully you can see this. Um, here we are in this big lecture hall and all of the students are staring at their laptops. So uh, maybe not the, the most ideal scenario. Um, certainly uh, this is again a very large lecture hall, so this maybe doesn't apply to you. You might have a smaller class, um, but some things that you can do to help create this inclusive space and, and to foster kind of the sense of community is that you can start to switch up the group dynamics. 
Uh, if you are in a <laughs> Tim is in Cole 100, great. <laughs> Uh, if you're in a face-to-face -face class, you can actually ask your students to get up and do things, uh, move around, physically interact. Uh, you know, it, it is kind of interesting. There have been studies performed where they, we look at students who walk into a classroom, and even though the seats aren't assigned, they tend to gravitate towards the same spots. Um, so you can physically ask them to get up and move and do things to change that group dynamic. It'll also change who they, who they sit next to, who they speak to, things like that. Whether or not you're back to face-to-face -face or you're doing hybrid, um, you can still add some more media components um, and conferencing, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Uh, and so you can add all of these components, again, just to help your students interact. If you have media components, uh, you can ask them to reflect maybe on some sort of a video, or you can make your media components interactive. Again, we'll have some more specific examples coming up on that. I also like the idea of setting some sort of a goal for each class. By the end of this class, students should be able to do, and then you fill in the blank, what should they be able to do? Um, this helps you just kind of stay on track you know, with your lesson planning, but it also reinforces the idea that the students have to actually interact and do something. So this could be write a paper, give a presentation, complete a lab, um, but just something small for that day that the students need to be able to um, finish a task. And of course, the other thing that we like to do is to offer up opportunities for your students to reflect um, and analyze their own work. So um, they, they also need to be actively involved uh, kind of in the evaluation process. One thing that I like to do with students is to set up mandatory office hours. And again, this can be accomplished face-to-face -face or you can do this virtually. Um, if you want to do it virtually, especially right now with the pandemic, then I do recommend trying to schedule this through Office 365 um, and Microsoft Bookings. So um, what you can do with your students is you just give them a whole bunch of times when you would be available. They pick the one that works best with their schedule and then it goes right on your calendar. Any slots that aren't filled uh, just remain blank. So um, it's not like you have to wall off your entire calendar for the entire day. You can do this one-on-one, -on -one, um, and you can also have some specific discussion topics prepared. So when they come to meet with you, um, have some questions that they need to, to ask or answer. Um, you can tell them that they need to come to the first meeting with at least two questions prepared. And that could be about the course. It could be maybe about the program. It could be something very loosely related to college. But um, just have them start the conversation. And so this will help them you know, kind of form a bond with you. Later on, if they have questions, they'll be more likely to approach you because they've already initiated a conversation. You may also want to set up more than one mandatory office hour meeting. So um, you could do this, again, I recommend starting this at least in the beginning of the semester and then having a follow-up appointment later on. So um, it, it just kind of reinforces this idea that you're still here, you're still approachable, and you still see them. All right, another idea that I have for you for creating this sense of community is to create a study group. And in this sense, you are the facilitator. So when you create a study group, you want to make sure that this is a voluntary thing. You're not going to take attendance and you're going to take a step back. This is actually where the students are going to lead the group. So one way that you can implement this is you can set up a study group prior to the start of a, a large assessment. So whether that's a big test or um, some type of a, a big lab, anything. And what you can do is you can provide a nice uh, study guide to your students. Once you set up the study group, you, the students can get together as a group and they can go through all of the items on your study guide and uh, they can help each other. 
somebody might know something about topic X, somebody else might know something about topic Y, and they trade ideas back and forth. If you want, as an educator, you can come in maybe at the last few minutes of the session and you can answer any remaining questions. But again, it's this idea that they are helping each other study. And I did put up on here some steps for how you can do this virtually, which I think is probably um, the most popular uh, way to study right now. So um, an easy way to do this is in Blackboard Collaborate. And so I, I know that the screenshot is a little bit small, but if you see the magnifying lens at the top uh, left corner of your screen, you can zoom in. So, um, and I can provide further information on and steps on how to do this if you have any questions. But basically you create the session um, and then you enable guest access so that you don't even have to be in there. Your students can start the session without you. So again, it's creating this environment for them. You've facilitated it, uh, but they're going to run it. Any questions on that? Okay, so um, we can move on to projects and assessments. So these could be any type of graded activity where you can help your students persevere, keep going, right? We're not gonna lose them halfway through the course. So we have some very specific ideas that you can help. Now, I saw somebody had mentioned in the chat earlier, I think there was something about, was it game theory? Um, but one idea is this concept that you can introduce gamification into your course. Gamification can be, again, something that is a graded assessment. You can also use some of these strategies, um, just almost like icebreakers to get your students talking and interacting. These don't always have to be graded assessments. They could just be activities. Um, but these are things that you can do hybrid, that you can implement in face-to-face. -face. Yes, I know game theory is not quite the same, um, but there might be a little bit of overlap so um, hopefully some of these are ideas that you've heard of. Some of these might be new as well. Um, I wanted to make sure to introduce some ideas here that we could at least use technology uh, that's already been provided to you by NIU. So uh, we don't wanna incur any extra costs. If you want to award badges and titles to your students based on performance, this is something that you can do through Blackboard. Um, many of you may have done some training through Blackboard, Title IX training, and at the end you get a certificate. Um, it, it's the same concept. So um, this is, again, a way to help your students uh, kind of incentivize them for stellar performance on something. If you're still using uh, Microsoft Teams, Collaborate, or Zoom to meet virtually, you, we can use uh, virtual breakout rooms. Um, some of the things that you can do in there are trivia games. You can also do things like Family Feud, uh, which we can do actually through PowerPoint slides and you can share them um, virtually that way. So there's still, still a lot of that going on. Yes, Kahoot is wonderful for trivia, I agree. Um, also free, so that one maybe isn't provided by NIU, but you can still use it for free. So I, I'm a big advocate. You can also do challenges and quests. So this goes along well with the idea that we are teaching adults. Adult learners really like to have control over some of their own uh, learning and education. So you can either give your students a sample of maybe topics that, um, they, can, that they can pursue, or you could even say, choose your own adventure type of a thing where uh, students have to create a proposal for their own project. Um, so this also gets them actively involved, hopefully picking out something that's relevant to the class, um, but also to their own personal interests. So lots of different ideas here. Um, scavenger hunts are a lot of fun for icebreakers. I do also see these um, used frequently, even with the course syllabus to make sure that your students are reading it. The other idea here is that we can promote a lot of student uh, work that they've produced themselves. So a big complaint that we heard from faculty during the pandemic is that they would record their lectures and, and some even said they felt like paid 
or unpaid actors sometimes um, because they were just speaking into space. They didn't know if their students were actively engaged. And so we want to kind of reframe that scenario. So one thing that you can do is if you're still um, recording discussions or lectures, you can post it in Blackboard to the discussion boards. In turn, your students can create their own video clip uh, to upload to the discussion board. So um, it, it's kind of this back and forth movement that everybody is contributing. Um, Keltra is our new video platform at NIU. And so it's free to staff, students, uh, and faculty. They even have a mobile app, which is wonderful because we know uh, that students have different types of technology. We don't always know what they have. Most people have a cell phone. So they can actually use this mobile app um, and create just a video in just a couple minutes, almost like a selfie, but they can upload it to the discussion board. So um, it's proved very useful. You can talk to them about using this app maybe for uh, field pictures, found art, things of that nature. I saw quite a few science instructor, instructors, pardon me, were using this app to, and sending their students to go and find specific you know, organisms or plant life and, and to upload a picture or a video to Blackboard. So it was really very interactive. You can also randomly distribute case studies. Uh, this also goes with the idea that students are going to generate their own original work. Um, the more types of, you know, random distribution of, of topics that you can introduce into your course, there's uh, less of a chance of plagiarism, things of that nature. We can also do things like this shark tank, which will actually provide a nice break for you as an instructor as well. It's a good chance for you to take a step back and to bring in professionals into the classroom. It breaks it up for the students as well. They get to interact with new people. Um, you know, you can make it kind of a competition. I've seen this done for uh, marketing courses where groups were randomly assigned a product and they had to come up with the new marketing slogan um, and they presented it to a, a series of instructors, I think people who are probably in the marketing field, um, and, and they were ranked. Um, so, so it kind of gave them, you know, a good perspective on, on what it means to compete in the marketing uh, industry. And of course, you can also use anonymous peer review in Blackboard again. So this is a nice way to take some of the pressure off of you for grading. Anonymous peer review means that the students won't see who who wrote what comment on their work, uh, but you as an instructor will. So that helps you kind of to make sure that everybody's on task and that they're staying up with their classroom expectations. Everything is professional and courteous, uh, but it's a great way to generate some feedback um, from, from other people who, who are working through kind of the same task that you are. So um, it's really good for your students. And I'm gonna pass this over to Yvonne. Thank you, Megan. And building upon what Megan said, she mentioned case, case studies. Uh, you could also use simulations, uh, portfolios, performances, experiments, depending upon the discipline that you teach. And a common thread in all of these projects that we've been showing you is that they, they require engagement and they support active learning. And you can provide feedback throughout the time that the students are learning. And if the students are actively engaged in their projects, then they're more likely to persist and continue learning in the course. And Anna had also talked about uh, using cahoots. And yes, that's a simple and, and very a popular, it's a great way to get the students engaged and you can gauge their, their knowledge by asking them some, some quick questions. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and it was it was a large conference, and the a uh, couple of professors were showing some of the techniques that they use, and one of them uh, distributed maybe seven different low value products: um, a box of Kleenex, a um, a simple microphone, a candle, just some very basic um, objects. And then the students were given some sort of a simple scenario. And 
then they were expected to negotiate um, and they had their one their one item and they were trying to negotiate to get the item that was most valuable to to solving their portion of this little scenario that the professor um, assigned to them and it was interesting to see how much people were willing to give up for um, some of the different objects and and the um, some people were not willing to budge much with their object. And so it was a simple way that the uh, professor kind of had the, the students act out this concept that he was discussing with, with a very large lecture hall um, of students. So that was an interesting, interesting example. And what other types of examples do you use? We have people in here from, from marketing and English and economics and math. What other types of projects do you use in your courses to keep the students engaged and help them to persist throughout the class? Do you have anything else you'd like to share for that? Let's see. One of the things that I do is I break up a very large project into smaller projects and scaffold those projects to guide students along that path of, of building that uh, research proposal. And then they're getting feedback throughout the entire process of, of their learning. And then, um, then they're expected to incorporate that feedback and, and hopefully their, their final project will be better. So that's one thing that you can do. And Megan says virtual breakout groups um, are your latest thing. Okay, you have, they have to strategize on how to solve a series of puzzle questions. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, that's interesting. And they would be, um, they, if there's something that's novel that kind of piques their interest, um, gets them excited, you know, there's some virtual puzzles and um, a little bit of challenge, then, then they can, um, they're more likely to stay engaged and persist in that. Thank you, Megan. And now we're going to talk about, let's see, Tim Sullivan, financial project on coming up with a monthly budget with certain expenses and purchasing a house. Okay, yes, that's great. And another aspect of, of keeping students engaged is that they need to see the value and applicability of the projects to their lives, to the courses, to their education. And everyone can see the, the value of developing a budget, a monthly budget that would address things like housing expenses. Okay, great. Okay, and then building upon the, um, did somebody, I heard, oh, Carrie, okay, you have students find and share photos online illustrating a concept that you were studying during the class period. That's terrific, Carrie. And so you're talking about a concept in the class, and then you continue to extend that learning into the, to the Blackboard learning management system, and the students need to go out and find um, some sort of illustration that, that represents that concept. That, that's terrific. And then you can look at those illustrations that the students have provided, and then you can use it as a formative assessment to determine, okay, are they clearly understanding this concept that we talked about, or maybe I need to do a little bit of clarification? Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie. And when we think about feedback, we need to think about ourselves as the instructors. You know, we have a um, certain amount of time, we teach several classes, spending hours on grading, teaching office hours, communicating with students. So there's a lot to, um, to manage in, in our time and we're busy. And so we need to, to be um, efficient about how we're engaging and, and keeping students engaged. And it's also important to think about students. And Dr. Linda Nilsson, we had her speak at um, a Teaching Effectiveness Institute at NIU a, a couple of years ago. She was, when we were still having them in person, and she's a leading researcher in um, teaching and learning. And she found that, you know, education, that a lot of aspects of it are kind of 
like a game now. And Megan had talked about gamification of, of education. And um, Linda said that students may now be seeking to kind of try to quote, win, unquote, by trying to accrue more points in the shortest amount of time, or this gamification can kind of lead students to maybe misplacing their focus on, on the grade rather than skill development, or maybe they're focusing on the grade so they can get a higher grade in the class, they wanna get a higher GPA, um, and the approach might be, okay, I'll try to get uh, I'll haggle with the professor over trying to get more points or is there extra credit they can do and things like that, get partial credit. Um, because they're busy too and they're focused on sort of the broader aspects of education. And if your course is, let's say, a prerequisite for a course that they're required to take in their program next semester, then they're going to be really, really focused on, okay, I have to get whatever that minimum grade is to um, qualify to, to be able to take this next required course in their program. And so they might be, um, you know, trying to negotiate with you about points and things like that. But there are things that we can, we can do to help them to focus on that skill development um, as opposed to focusing on the grade, the high, high GPA, next class, graduation, employment, um, this year I'm teaching a UNIV 101 course and it, it's the first time I've ever taught undergrads and I really wanted to teach it because I wanted to see the difference between some of their behaviors and um, because I've taught graduate students for years and so um, you know this is their first semester in college and they're thinking about the um, you know their jobs already okay Anna let's see um, makes a lot of sense to me. You know, some tips getting to treat their original assignment as the way to get points, getting into the course early instead of being. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and we're going to talk about um, strategies for that. Yes, thank you, Anna. Anna. Um, okay, so to try to help students to focus on those um, assignments um, that you that are important now. Um, we can sort of guide them along the process and, and use feedback techniques to um, engage them in the content that we're teaching them now and incentivize them to um, continue to develop their skills. And formative feedback is a, a very important tool that we have as instructors. And we're giving students responses to their work while they're learning. And that's different than if they take a final project, uh, they submit a final project and there's a, um, an end grade. So the formative feedback is when we have those opportunities to incentivize students and to encourage them. When they're learning new concepts and learning new insights, um, formative um, assessments can let us as instructors know about strengths and weaknesses of both the teaching and learning processes. And if we see that when we're looking at assignments that students had submitted, and maybe you see a common gap in, in some of the concepts that they have applied. And so then you might start thinking about, okay, how did I teach this concept? How did I teach this theory? You know, it doesn't seem that they're applying it in the way that um, it was meant to be applied. And then you can provide constructive, encouraging, formative feedback to help them to, to correct that misconception. And then when they're submitting subsequent work, they can um, gain more points because they're applying that concept correctly. And providing that additional uh, support through formative feedback, it helps build students' confidence. They, they feel that they're supported. They feel that you're providing constructive feedback, and so you care about them, and they're more likely to stay engaged and persist through those challenging aspects of a course because they believe that you're going to be um, supportive and, and be there if they have any questions or issues. Um, yes, and thank, thank you, Megan. And the 
when you're providing the, the feedback, it's, um, it helps students to see how they're progressing and it also helps you see how, how they're progressing. And it has been uh, positively related to persistence. Another thing that you can do is you can give students options for meeting the learning objectives. And so um, let's say that they have, um, for instance, in a, in a course I'm teaching, um, students need to present to, to the class and they need to present and, and address certain, um, certain learning objectives. Um, but I've given them the option to present. They can present it on Blackboard Collaborate during a live session. They can present, record it and present it in a discussion board and answer questions about it. Or they can present it face to face and have a discussion that way. And what I found is that, you know, they need to be addressing these certain key concepts no matter which way they're presenting it. I've found that students like those options. They've given me feedback, it's formative feedback for me, that um, they, they like the fact that they can share their knowledge in um, different ways, ways that fit them and fit their preferences as students. And then they're more likely to um, stick with those projects and with that course. And I was teaching an um, um, edu educational technology course a, a few years ago, and one of the students was just not engaging. And I was kind of racking my brain thinking about what can I do to you know, get this student engaged. And then I started offering options for some of the assignments. And he just, he just took off and, and just blossomed. Um, so it really, it really helped him to persist. And if I hadn't really thought about um, giving them options and things, I think that he probably wouldn't have um, stuck with the class. So um, that turned out as a win-win situation. Also aligning that feedback and the learning objectives with their academic careers, with their um, academic programs, long-term goals helps. And when you can connect that feedback and their assignments with the students' goals, then they see value in it and they're going to persist and stay with the class. If the students don't feel that the feedback and the assignments and the course is really relevant to them, it's not important to them, then they're less likely to persist. And the, the encouraging tone is very important too. Um, so overall, the formative feedback helps to draw out the students' best efforts and it helps uh, students stay with and uh, be more successful in college. And when you're deciding about types of feedback, Think about how you're going, how this feedback is going to be uh, provided and by whom. So sometimes um, it might be appropriate to have students provide feedback to each other. Maybe they're just learning something, it's kind of a low stakes. So you kind of get them together in small groups or virtual breakouts and they provide feedback to each other. Um, when, when students are working on early versions of of something that's going to evolve into a big project at the end of the course, then detailed feedback is important early in that process so that they can integrate the feedback and, and revise and produce better work as the semester goes on. If you provide all the detailed feedback on their final project and they never see you again, then they're not going to see, they're not going to be able to incorporate that feedback into, they could incorporate it in the next class, but they couldn't um, make their products better in your class. And think about different ways to provide feedback, maybe digital, uh, verbal. Um, and I incorporate reflection quite a bit in my courses. Um, so I'll ask pointed questions, like guiding questions to the students and have them reflect. And it, it helps them to find the answers within themselves, as opposed to always saying, okay, let me ask the professor, you know, what does the professor say about this? What's the professor say about this? So I try to guide them through finding the answers within themselves. Um, so I might say, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, case study was an example of the theory of XYZ. Um, did anything surprise you about how 
you know, the theory of XYZ was applied in this business or in this research project. What was it and why? How did that compare to uh, what we discussed in class? You know, you might do a compare con contrast or, um, but I have them, it, it's kind of an open-ended set of a few questions and then they have to discover those answers um, themselves. And each student is going to come up with unique answers. And um, it really helps them to kind of become more independent, self-directed learners. And one thing I also ask is, how did you, how did you do on this assignment? Um, what would you do the same next time? What would you do differently? You know, and sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I probably should have done this. Um, earlier in the semester instead of waiting till the last month. You know, they're usually pretty honest about what they could do differently. And the, the screen has a couple of examples of feedback that you might give. The, on the left side, the feedback is, um, on number one, the comment is this area is vague, I don't know what you mean. So that doesn't really give the student, it's not very constructive, but number on number one on the right side says you need more outside resource claim. How do you plan to build your credibility? So they have to think about, think about that and then answer it. So it kind of incentivizes them to, okay, I need to, I need to discover an answer for this. I need to apply to my next um, assignment. And then in number two, it says this is a run on sentence and tells them how to fix just that, that one sentence. But on number two on the right side says, I've identified a run on sentence for you, but now what, you know, where can you find similar errors and, and correct them in your paper? So we're saying, okay, I've found this one, you know, you know that that's wrong, you know how to fix it now, fix it throughout the paper. So you're kind of giving them that charge to, um, complete those errors throughout the entire paper. And in number three, they're saying, you know, that's a great point. Um, you thoughtfully analyze the aspects of the case, but number three on the right side is more, um, it's giving tips, it's positive reinforcement. And then it says on your next research assignment, be sure that you continue to document and provide support for those opposing viewpoints. And so you're telling them, okay, next time. And so this is kind of taking the students along gradually in the course. And so those are some examples of, of feedback. And Megan is going to build upon um, that. She's going to talk about grading and how you use grading for engagement. Great, okay. I know we're, we're getting close to time here, so I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, there are some different things that we can do with grading to incentivize our students to, to keep them engaged, to keep coming back um, to class, to keep talking to you. Uh, one of them is just to postpone the grade. So it's not that you are behind on your grading. That's not what I mean by postponing the grade. Um, but before you give that grade to your students, um, you can ask them to do something first. And I learned about this actually when I was studying for to become a teacher. And uh, one of my mentors said, every time I hand back essays in a class, he's like, I just stand back and I watch. And it never fails. The students all flip to the very last page because that's where their grade is at. He was like, I spent all this time writing down my feedback, um, but they just flipped to the grade. So um, you, what you can do is instead, when you give back some sort of a graded assessment, you can ask your students to reflect, you know, on how they intend to incorporate the feedback that you've just so thoughtfully provided um, into a revision or into their next assignment. Um, and, you know, if there's no revision applicable, the, we can't always um, grade that much work. So, you know, schedule revisions accordingly. Um, but you can ask them to reflect on things like what kind of skills have they learned? And, you know, what are they going to take from this assignment uh, moving forward with their coursework? Um, can they use it even outside of your course? Can they make that connection? Um, is this something that'll help them in the program, which could help them as professionals, as adults, uh, things of that nature. 
So after they've done some type of a reflective piece, then you can hand out the grades. So that's one aspect that you can use. You can also mandate conferences. That's again, another way that you can postpone the grade. They, they can't have their grade until they come talk to you. Um, and when that happens, you can have your students try to lead the conference. Um, again, you can sit down and say, what would you like to discuss about your, your test or about your, your project, your presentation, your essay, whatever it is that, that you've had your students complete. Um, but the idea is when you're having a conference with your student, try to make sure that they're the ones who are speaking for the duration of, of that interaction. You can also provide a rubric and ask students to self-grade. Um, I am a big advocate for rubrics anyway, um, but based on that outline criteria, uh, where do they think that they excelled? Uh, where do they think that they need some improvement? And, and then you can compare it to your own graded rubric for, for the assessment. Um, another one that I really like to do if you have the time is to show students random samples of student work. This is particularly helpful um, if you have taught this course in the past or if you have colleagues who would be willing to share some old um, examples of student work. You can just remove the names and, and keep it private that way. Um, but a, a really good exercise is to introduce the student work to your students, ask them to physically grade it um, as an individual. Um, don't, don't let them get together as a group until they've actually physically marked down a grade. So if they were looking at a case study that a student um, maybe wrote, you know, for, again, this could be a previous class and they say, oh, I think it's a B. Um, or I think it's an A. Make sure they physically mark down what they think that grade is, uh, then divide them up into groups and, and see if they all arrived at the same answer. If they didn't, um, then as a group, they have to come to a consensus on, on what that grade should be. Uh, this kind of makes them feel like they have ownership of their, of their own education. They're in charge. Um, it, it makes them really look at these rubrics, at the, at the prompts, right? Uh, they, they are in charge of their own fate, if you will. And this is one that I actually swiped from one of my colleagues, and I, I was hesitant about it, but he assured me that it works. So um, it's this idea that you revise to mastery. And this, again, goes back to, I think, uh, Linda B. Nelson's um, theory that gamification sometimes isn't a positive thing. Uh, sometimes we have students who just want to get the points that they need um, and move on. Uh, versus as instructors, we really want them to master some type of a skill. So uh, one of these kind of conflicts that we sometimes face with students is if they know that a revision is coming, uh, they'll just get in a first draft and, and it might not be their best work and they know it's not their best work, but hey, you know, they have other classes they need to focus on, um, you know, family, work obligations. But as long as they get in that first draft, they know that they can go back in later um, and fix it and, and accrue back some of those missing points. So to kind of help your students uh, think, you know, about how they want to approach their, their coursework, you might say that um, I am going to grade your, your first draft. I'm going to put a grade on it. And if you're not satisfied with it, um, you can you can keep returning uh, another revision until you've achieved mastery. Now, I, I was skeptical about this because I wondered how this impacted the grading workload for the instructor, uh, but they assured me that students really don't wanna have to keep revising and revising and revising. So you set the criteria for what is a revision. So for instance, I have a nephew in high school. I, I have to impress upon him that a revision does not mean just fixing a couple of grammar errors, maybe changing a sentence here or there um, and resubmitting it. A revision is really when you go back to the drawing board and, and you kind of start. Um, Tim says that he's been doing unlimited full revision attempts with homework for years now on third party websites. Fantastic, I, I would love to hear about this. Um, but again, so if your student maybe got a C on that first attempt, they revise it. Maybe they didn't really do a, a great revision attempt. I mean, you might see some improvement, but it still isn't mastery. Um, you send it back to them just with more comments. You don't grade it. Um, and, and the student will, again, maybe have to um, revise again and, and resubmit. But um, usually when this happens, students 
they don't want to have to revise it three or four times. So um, either they're going to try to get it right on the very first attempt or that next revision, they're, they're going to put all their effort into it and, and they're really going to take your, your feedback to heart. So I was skeptical about it, but I've been assured that it works well. Tim, I, it sounds like it, maybe if you've been doing this for years that it, it does in fact work. So I, I would love to hear from you. Um, but yes, this is again another idea on how we can change the grading system for our students. I have also heard that grading right now sometimes encompasses too much. It might encompass um, attendance, extra credit. It, it might encompass um, daily participation. And um, Linda Nilsson's claim was that we need to go back just to mastery of skill level. We want to make sure that when a student passes our course that they really have the skills they need um, to, to move on in that program or in that field. Great. So I think we're officially at the Q&A period. So um, 